Father, we come to you this morning with a desire to hear from your word, not things that will tickle our ears, Lord, things that will stir our hearts, things, Lord, that will cause us to see ourselves as you see us, cause us to see you for who you are. We pray this morning, Lord, for our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering because of the name of Jesus. And remind us, Lord, of the great freedoms we have, the great privileges we have, and that we should not take them for granted. We pray for this time together that all that we say and do would bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I am going to read a significant passage of Scripture. If you wish to stand with me, you can, but we're going to read the entire chapter 3 of First Samuel. This morning's message is entitled, Hearing the Voice of God. Last week, we talked about knowing God. This week, we're talking about hearing God. And now I am in First Samuel, chapter 3. I'm going to begin in verse 1 of chapter 3. If you wish to stand with me in honor of reading the Word of God, you may do so. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. It happened at at that time as Eli was laying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of of God was. That the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call my son, lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he rose and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. For Samuel... So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end, for I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons brought a curse on themselves, and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning. And then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, but Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And he said, what is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. All Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord, and the Lord appeared again at Shiloh because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Thus the word of Samuel came to all Israel. You may be seated. We often speak to God. I mean, I don't know about you, but I speak to God a lot. Throughout the day, it's an ongoing conversation. Sometimes it's more than others. But we talk to God a lot. The question is, do we hear from God? We talk, but are we listening? Because communication is a two-way street. And probably one of the most frequent questions that comes to me as a pastor is, Pastor, how do I know what God's will is? How do I know what God's direction is? How can I hear the voice of God? And all of us would love it if we could, like Samuel, be in that situation where we heard this audible voice and God spoke and shared everything with us, but that is not how he speaks to us normally today. In chapter 1, we saw the birth of Samuel and how Hannah, his mother, had given him to the service of God and and then we, we, we begin to see how the sons of Eli in chapter 2 were wicked and God is pronouncing judgment on them. And now here as we come to chapter 3, we begin to see the beginning of this ministry, this prophetic ministry that Samuel receives from the Lord and how God is going to bless him. 
But it all begins with him hearing the voice of God and adequately and appropriately responding to what he hears. And so this morning, I want us to walk through the text, and then I have some observations with you towards application. The narrator, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, begins by reminding us again that Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. Even though Eli has been negligent to fulfill his responsibilities as a father and a high priest, a spiritual leader to Israel, he's still in a position of, of authority. And to young Samuel's credit, he submits himself to that authority. Now, there's something to be said about submitting yourself to the authority God puts over you, even when you know that authority is flawed, even when you can find fault. We live in a day of antinomianism, of no law, of no respect for authority of any kind, because we can all find fault with those in authority, because if the truth be known, every one of us have faults. But that doesn't keep Samuel from submitting himself to the authority of Eli. Now, we move from Samuel individually to Israel corporately. The text makes a statement about the scarcity of the word of God. Literally, it says there was no vision spread abroad. God was obviously speaking to individuals here and there, but as he had spoken to Hannah, remember, when she prayed, but the reality is the word of God was rare in that day. Visions were infrequent. The Hebrew word translated vision is the same word found in Proverbs 29, 18 that says, where there's no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. And, and maybe you've heard that sermon preached from where there's no vision and the pastor's talking about having vision for church growth or having vision for direction, but that's not what that word means. That word in the Hebrew speaks to God's revelation of himself and his will to his people through his word. In this case, the prophet, where there's no prophetic revelation from God, the people cast off restraint. And that's exactly what was happening in Israel. The people, the Bible says, there was no king in Israel and each man did what was right in his own eyes. And let me tell you something, that's what's going on in the United States of America today. There is no vision from God. We are having a moral absolute meltdown in our country because we are not hearing from God. Chat verse 2 says, Eli was lying down. It was night. His eyes had begun to grow dim. The Hebrew literally says he was not able to see. The tra word translated see is an interesting word because in its present construction, it notes the inability not only to see with your eyes, but to see with your mind, to understand, to comprehend. It's the root word from which the word seer or prophet comes from. Thus, the text is speaking to more than just his physical eyesight. It is telling us that Eli is afflicted with spiritual cataracts. His sin has desensitized his ability to sense what God is doing. Verse 3 says, the lamp of the Lord had, yet not, had not yet gone out. On one level, this is speaking about the oil lamp that was kept burning all night in the house of the Lord. On another level, it's telling us that while there were many who could not and would not hear the voice of God and see what God was doing, there was one at least who was, and that was Samuel. God was speaking to Samuel. He's lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of the Lord was. The ark was the place where the physical presence of God dwelt with his people. The text is saying that even though Samuel doesn't yet understand who's speaking to him, even though he has not yet received the word of the, the Lord, that God is close to him. God has appointed and anointed Samuel for a, a specific purpose. Verses 4 through 9, we see this calling on Samuel's life. Samuel doesn't recognize the voice. Instead, he thinks it's uh, someone else calling his name. It's almost an Abbott and Costello moment. Who's on first? You called? No, I didn't call. You, you called? I didn't call. There's a little bit of humor here. And, 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 and the interesting thing is that it takes three times for Eli, the prophet, to figure it out. And finally, he says, well, son, you know... It's not me that's calling you. It's probably God. Next time he says something, you just respond, say, speak, Lord. Your, your servant hears. 
So as at other times, God says, Samuel, Samuel, and he says, speak for your servant is listening. Literally, he says, your servant is hearing. The word translated hearing also means to obey in the Hebrew language. Thus incorporated within his answer is a positive response that whatever you say, I will do, God. It's interesting to note that the first thing God says to Samuel is a word of judgment against Eli. Because of the sin, the Bible says that Eli knew. Again, this word knew is a very powerful word. It speaks to intimate relationship. It's, it's the kind of word that says, and Adam knew Eve and she conceived. It's the kind of word that says, and Elkanah knew his wife Hannah and she conceived. It speaks about intimacy. And, and in the Bible, in this context, is telling us that Eli had an intimate knowledge of the sin that his sons were involved in, and he did not rebuke them for it. But God's word would not fail. Nothing could stop his plan from coming to fruition. Samuel receives the word of judgment. He lies back down. We can imagine that he probably doesn't go back to sleep. I don't know about you, but if God speaks to me at night and I hear his voice, it's not going to be like, okay, now I can turn back and go to sleep. I don't even sleep on Saturday nights when I've got to preach the next morning. I can't imagine what was going through his young mind and his head and his heart. He gets up the next morning. Eli confronts him, demands that he says everything that God says, and he holds nothing back. He's faithful, and, and, and notice Eli's response. Eli is wise enough and experienced enough to know that if God says something, it will come to pass, and Eli says, well, if, if, if that's what God wants to do, then so be it. He surrenders himself to what's coming, the final verses of our text tell us about the continued ministry of Samuel. God does not let any of his words fail or fall to the ground. All that he says will come to pass. And all Israel knows that Samuel is confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. The Bible says in verse 21, the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, whereas before the ministry of Samuel, the word of the Lord had been rare. There was no vision. Now that has changed. A new era has been ushered in because there is one who is faithful to hear and to speak the word of God. And he reveals himself and he speaks to Samuel, and Samuel, as his prophet, speaks to Israel. Things have changed. Now, remembering that God has given us uh, his word not just to fill our minds, not just to fill our heads, but to fill our hearts and form our hands, what is it the text is telling us this morning for you and for me? How do we take this and put it into application? Well, the first thing I want to talk to you about is hearing the voice of God. One of the most fascinating things about this text is it gives us a specific instance in which someone is called by God. They hear his voice, they respond. Perhaps that's the overarching question that pastors get all the time. How can I hear the voice of God? How can I know what God wants me to do? And I'm going to give you four principles that will help you understand how to hear the voice of God. The first one is this. Hearing God's voice stems from relationship, not just knowledge. Hearing God's voice stems from relationship, not just knowledge. Clearly, Samuel was within the hearing distance of Eli's voice. That's why he thought it was Eli who was talking to him. But Eli could not hear the voice of God when he called to Samuel. Eli could not hear, not just because he was old and hard of hearing, but because there was sin in his life. And like so many people today, he had drifted through life with good intentions, but he had not been intentional about doing good. Let me say that again. He drifted through life with good intentions, but he had not been intentional about doing what was good. A lot of people are going to hell today with good intentions. And that's what the, that's what, uh, the, the, kind of the proverb says. It doesn't say it in the scripture, but we say that. We say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well, I meant to do it. I was going to get around to it. I knew that I should do it, but I just never did. Eli knows a great deal about the workings of God, the word of God, but his sin has negatively impacted his fellowship, and that sin dulled his spiritual sensitivity and made him spiritually hard of hearing. 
Folks, let me tell you, one reason a lot of people never hear from God anymore is because of unconfessed, unrepentant sin in their life. And if God's not moving in our churches, if he's not moving in our denomination, if he's not moving in our nation, if he's not moving in our individual lives, it's not because God isn't speaking, it's because we are not hearing the voice of God. And the reason we don't hear the voice of God is because of unconfessed, unrepentant sin. The Bible says in Jeremiah 6.10, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. God told the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 12, to son of man, you live in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see but do not see, ears to hear but do not hear because they are a rebellious house. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul says a time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate to themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths when our hearts are not where they should be and our relationship with God is not what it could be and ought to be we are not going to hear what God has to say so the difficulty of hearing his voice is doubled not only because we don't have the capacity because of sin but we no longer have the desire You see, sin not only separates us from God, it changes our desires. It draws us away so that we don't have a desire to hear the word of God anymore. We don't hunger and thirst for it. The reason Samuel can hear the voice of God and the thing which will enable you and me to hear the voice of God is a heart that is submitted, a will that is surrendered, and a life that is absolutely in his control. The second thing I want you to see about hearing the voice of God is that hearing God's voice necessitates a willingness to obey, not merely to be curious. There are those who merely have a curiosity about what God has to say. Well, I kind of like to know what God has to say on this matter. What do you think, preacher? I got to tell you, there's a lot of people like that. They want to take God's word and kind of take it into a, consideration well I'll I'll take that under consideration I'll take it as some advice and I'll put it in my my little uh, processor and I'll think about it that's not how Samuel approaches it Samuel approaches God's voice with a predetermination to obey And God tends to speak to those people who have already made their mind up they're living with a made-up mind when God speaks I do I obey it's not something that I'll consider. It's not, something, it's not one of many options. It is, he speaks, I obey. That's what Samuel says. Speak, Lord, for your servant is going to obey. This is a point we should not overlook. Oftentimes we hear the voice of the Lord as a king hears counsel. We take it under advisement. We factor it into all of our other things that before we make our decision. But there's a difference between Samuel and Eli. Eli knew the word of God and had chosen not to obey it. Samuel had not yet heard the word of the Lord, but had decided beforehand he would obey it. And obedience means action. It doesn't mean acknowledging that God has spoken. And tell you how many people come up to the preachers after church and say, preacher, man, you stepped on my toes. I needed to hear that. I'm not going to do anything about it, but I needed to hear it. Folks, that doesn't do you any good. That's like getting a pers- going to the doctor, getting a prescription, and saying, I sure do need to take this medicine. Maybe someday I will. Doesn't do you a bit of good. Samuel has a predetermination to obey. If you want God to speak to you, if you want him to give you clarity as to what his will and his direction is in your life, you've got to come to the point that first and foremost, irrespective of what he says, you are going to obey. You see, the issue is not what God says, but the fact that God says it. There's a third thing. When God speaks to you, it will almost always be with a view towards your involvement in his purpose. You see, Henry Blackaby picked up on this. And that is that God is inviting us to work where he's working. God is always at work. God is always at work. 
And for those who will listen, for those who have a disposition and a will and a heart to obey, he's going to invite them into his work. He's going to say, I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. If you're not being used by God, if you're not involved in what God, God is doing, that's not God's fault. When we are not involved in what God is doing, it's because we have misplaced priorities. We have not been listening. We've not been paying attention. You know, one of our problems, it's all of our problems, not just not just my problem, it's your problem too. It's all of our problems. It's, it, it's, it, it comes with being human. Is when we hear from God, we want him to tell us something for us. God, you got a word for me today? Is, is there some way you're going to bless me today? Bless me, bless me, bless me, Lord, bless me. What's the word for me? Because we know it's all about me. You see, one of the reasons we don't hear the voice of God is oftentimes God is more concerned about how he's going to use you than what he's going to give you. God speaks to Samuel and he says, the first thing he says to Samuel is, now I got a word of judgment for the house of Eli and you're going to deliver it. And Samuel, if he had been a modern-day Christian, would have said, that's all well and good, God. You know, I'll get around to that. What about me? It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about what God is doing. It's about God's glory. And if we want to get in the flow of what God is doing, we got to get over ourselves. There's a fourth thing. God speaks to us in many ways, but he always speaks in consonance with his word. Now, that's not an insignificant point. That's probably the most important point. God may speak through a sermon. He may speak through a devotional you read this morning. He may speak through a sermon you heard online, or he may speak to you through your spouse. He may speak to you through the church. God speaks through his people. Can't tell you how many young preachers, I wonder if God's calling me to preach, and people in the church would have come up to him and said, you know, I've been praying, and God's got a plan for you, and God speaks through his people. But whenever God speaks, listen to me, he always speaks in accordance with his word. He never says anything to anyone that is not in consonance, in keeping, in lockstep with his word, because God never contradicts himself. Many people claim that God spoke to them and said this or that. They claim they've had some unique mountaintop mystical experience. But what they claim God said simply doesn't stand up to what he's already said in his word. And that's way, one way we know that God did not speak to them. Maybe they had a dream. Maybe they had a bad piece of apple pie before they went to bed. I don't know. But if it's not in keeping with God's word, it wasn't God that was speaking to them. That's why we need to know the word of the Lord. It's his revelation of himself to us. That's why the verse, verse 21 of our text says, the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Some people see that as a messianic reference, as a, 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 a prefigure that Jesus actually, who is the living word, the logos, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Many people believe, so Jesus was actually a theophany. Jesus was speaking to him there. The Bible says in Acts 17 of the people at Berea, now these were more noble-minded than those at Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. God always speaks in agreement with his word, but when God speaks, it's because he wants us to speak on his behalf. And so our first point was hearing the voice of God. Now I want to talk to you about faithfully speaking for God. Even as people are born with physical bodies that crave physical food, so each person is born with a spiritual nature and they crave spiritual sustenance. The question is, will they be fed on the word and the truth of God or will they be fed on the lies of the devil? 
For people to feed on the word of God, God's servants have to be faithful to speak his word. They've got to speak it when it's pleasant to hear, when it's unpleasant, as Paul would say, in season and out of season. One of the truths we gather from this text is that when God speaks and calls on us to speak for him, we're not given the option of only speaking those things that are pleasant and will make people like us. We have to speak things that are unpleasant and will cause people to hate us if that's what God has says, if that's what it means to speak the whole counsel of the word of God. And can I just tell you that that's one of the problems with Christianity in America today is we have lily-livered, spineless, yellow-bellied preachers who want to be accepted by the culture more than accepted by God and they're afraid to stand up and preach against sin they're afraid to call Christians to holiness they're afraid to call for repentance because they don't want to be unpopular but I want to tell you something folks it's not going to matter on judgment day what the world thinks of us it's going to matter what God knows of us whether or not we've been faithful to preach his word We rightly gather from the text that when Eli comes to Samuel and says, now, you tell me everything. In fact, if you don't tell me everything, everything that he said, I hope worse happens to you if you don't tell me everything he said. Now, put yourself in Samuel's shoes for a minute. You're a kid. Samuel's like the big cheese. No, Eli's the big cheese. Samuel's this little tiny runt. And Eli says, you tell me everything. And Samuel's like, yeah. Can you imagine? Just put yourself in his shoes for a minute. He doesn't want to tell him, yeah, the hammer's about to drop on your head, bro. Samuel's not going to tell him how to have his best life now. I can tell you that right now. Samuel is about to speak a word of judgment that he did not want to speak. It brought him no joy to speak it, but it was what God had told him. And so if he was going to be faithful, he had to preach that. And folks, you and I are spokespeople, spokesmen, spokeswomen for God. We live in a day and age when God has sent us out into a very dark and corrupt world and he's called us to speak truth. We talked about Proverbs 29, 18 that says where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Without doubt, that's one of the reasons our culture is in the spiritual cesspool it's in. It's one of the reasons that 80% of our churches are plateaued or decline. 80% of our churches, and you go to any statistic in the Southern Baptist Convention, 80% of our churches are either plateaued or are in decline. Of 48,000 churches, there are usually 10 to 12,000 churches every year that don't baptize a single person. You think that's what God wants? And, and, And what happens when we turn the television on or we open up the newspaper and there's some scandal about a a pastor or a church leader assaulting someone or having an affair or absconding with money that belonged to God. Folks, listen to me. You and I have a responsibility to speak God's truth because God's truth will keep us where we're supposed to be. Thy word is a lamp. It's a light. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandment. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The problem with our culture, the problem with our churches is we're not hearing the word of God. We're hearing sermonettes about how to have a better life or how to have better communication skills or how to get over depression. I want to tell you what we need is a clear faithful word from God and if 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 we don't faithfully give God's word then everybody's going to cast off restraint preachers today so afraid well I don't want to offend anybody they might not come back to my church folks it's not up to you to save them God saves them you preach the word God will do the rest there's a third thing It's a word about who God uses. 
It should not be lost on us that God chose to use a young boy as his spokesman. Samuel was probably not even shaving by this time. The word translated boy in verse 8 is the same word used in 1 Samuel 17 to speak of David who was but a youth when he fought Goliath. The point is that God is no respecter of persons or age. He will use people young and old so long as they will hear and obey. Moses was 80 before God began to use him. Think about that. Moses was 80 before his ministry started. Samuel's just a lad. God used Jesus to do the Father's will when he was a boy of 12, according to Luke chapter 2. The key is that Samuel approached God with a childlike faith. And that's what it takes if we're going to be in right relationship with God and be used by him. Now, there's a difference between being childish and having a childlike faith. Being childish means that you are immature and irresponsible. Childlikeness, however, speaks to a depth of humility and a purity of faith that takes God at his word and surrenders fully to his commands. Our problem, we've got a lot of childish people, but we don't have enough with childlike faith. We've got a lot of people who are physically grown, but spiritually immature. God's not impressed by what we can accomplish. He's not impressed by the amount of wealth we can amass. He, he doesn't use us based on how much education we have or what others think of us or fail to think of us. In God's economy, it's not the external, but the internal that counts. That's why God will say to Samuel later on as he rejects Eliab the brother of David do not look at his appearance or the height of his nature of his stature because I have rejected him for God sees not as man sees for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart folks we got to start understanding that at the end of the day that's the determining factor as to whether or not God uses us it has nothing to do with your height and everything to do with your heart. You may feel that because you come from humble beginnings or because you don't have the right pedigree or because you've made mistakes in the past that God cannot use you and nothing could be further from the truth. Moses was a murderer and God used him. I don't know, you may be listening this morning, you made me a murderer, but I want to tell you something, God can still use you. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. There's a final thing here, and I, I really can't, I can't stress how important this is. This text points us to Jesus. I want to show you how it does. Samuel is a type or a symbol of Jesus. A type in the Old Testament is a foreshadow of something or someone greater that has yet to come. And we see this in the life of Samuel as he points us to Jesus. Both of their births were miraculous, albeit the birth of Jesus was more miraculous. Both babies were anointed and appointed by God before their birth. Both mothers sang a Magnificat or a song of praise to God for their sons. Like Jesus, Samuel was a prophet and a priest, whereas Samuel is faithful to proclaim the word of God to Israel. Jesus is the word of God sent to seek and, the, to, and save the lost of the house of Israel. Whereas Samuel hears the voice of God, Jesus is the voice of God. Jesus in John 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them. In our text, in verse 15, we're told that Samuel opens the doors of the house of the Lord. Again, this is both literal and figurative. Literally, it means that he physically opened the doors to the tabernacle, as was his daily responsibility. But it's figuratively as well, because now, because God is speaking, because he has a faithful servant who will hear and faithfully speak what God has said, now the doors are open again, and people can come and hear from God and be in right relationship with God. But Jesus not only opens the doors to heaven, Jesus is the door to heaven. In John 10, he says, truly, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that, you, that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In the ancient world, there were two types of sheep pens. 
Now remember, the Bible is written to an agrarian, agrarian culture, to a, a culture where a lot of people understood a lot more about sheep and goats and cattle and crops and stuff than we do. If you want to have lamb, you hope Kroger has it in stock. In the ancient world, they would go out and kill the fatted calf, the, the lamb. It, 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 that's, they understood these illustrations. So in the ancient world, there are two kinds of sheep pens. One was in town, so, and it was built up a nice stone wall, and there would be a fixed wooden gate. And when the shepherd would come back from grazing his sheep, he would put them in the sheep pen, lock the gate, and the sheep were safe. But oftentimes the shepherd would take the sheep out into the pasture and he would be gone for days, maybe even weeks at a time, trying to find green pastures. He leads me in green pastures. And when he was out in the wild, there was no pen to put them in, so he would take stones and he would make a makeshift pen. And because he didn't have the tools to make a door, he would leave a small opening. It would be a round in, uh, an enclosure. He would leave a small opening and he himself would lay down in front of that sheep pen. He would be the door so that nothing and no one could get to the sheep. He was the door. This is what Jesus is saying. He uses this imagery to tell us that he's the door to heaven. No one gets in except through him, and no one, once they get in, gets out. He's the door. It is through him that we gain entrance into the house of God, into the family of God. Through him, we're adopted into the family, and no one can snatch us. That's why he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hands. I and the Father are one. Jesus is the door. We live in a day and age of pluralism, of syncretism. Pluralism says there's many paths to God. You just need to find one. I was listening to the radio yesterday. I, was, I have XM radio in my car. I was listening. And in the 1980s, there was a song that said, Yamo be there. And it was Yahweh and Muhammad will be there. Listen, let me tell you something. Muhammad's not going to be there. He's already in hell. Yahweh, God, will be there. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And don't get me wrong, there are some really nice people who are Muslims, some really nice people who are Buddhist, there's some really nice people who are in all kinds of religions that are false. They're not bad people, they're just lost. And they need Jesus. And that's what he's called us to do. So we don't need to say, well, you know, when we have a revival, when we have an evangelism conference, when we have this, then, then we'll get busy about it. No, our verse this month says, don't say four months into the harvest. Lift up your eyes. Look, see, the fields are white unto harvest. The, the young person waiting on you at the restaurant, the guy changing your oil, the, the person working out next to you at the gym. Maybe they're going to hell and, and, and maybe you're the only Christian in their life. When you stand before God, the Bible says, Son of man, <clears throat> I've made thee a watchman of the house of Israel. Therefore hear and give warning. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked ways. The same wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Folks, I want to tell you something. God's given us a responsibility. <clears throat> if we will he hear his voice, if we will be faithful to speak what he says, he will use us to bring people to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that it is ever true. It never fails. Thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be a part of what you're doing. Father, my prayer this morning is that we will begin to see the world like you see it. That we'll begin to see, Lord, that what this world needs now is a true, faithful word from you. Yes, a word of love, but a word of judgment because the two are inseparable, Lord. Because on the cross, Jesus took our punishment. 
That's how bad sin is. And that's where your love is seen because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, my prayer this morning, so if there's one person here, one person online, one person watching on YouTube, never surrendered their life to you, never given themselves to you, that this morning they would do that. They would surrender their life, ask you to forgive them of their sins, and accept you as the Savior, the Master, the King of their life. Father, there may be some this morning, believers, and they have sin in their life, sin of self-righteousness, sin of judgmentalism, physical sins, sexual sins, all kinds of sins. Father, this morning, you're calling them to repentance. You're saying, I want you to hear me. I want to use you. I want to be in relationship with you. And you're calling them to repent. I pray, Lord, that you who alone searches the hearts would draw men and women, boys and girls, to yourself even now. In Jesus' name, stand with me as we sing this morning. I've decided to follow Jesus. If that's true, you sing it. If it's not yet true, it can be true for you today. You come as we sing.